He headed the emergency unit at uh, MSF's office in Barcelona and director of operations also in Barcelona and Amsterdam. Uh, he then switched to work for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Pakistan, Iraq and Afghanistan and finally came back home to MSF in 2010 where he's been president. So please give a very warm welcome to Jose Bastos. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation to MSF, a medical humanitarian organization, to stand here and interact and explain ourselves and have a, have a mutual fertilization. I think it's extremely important. I have to say that I feel enormously humbled um, in front of such a deployment of, of uh, well-known professors who know their matters in, well in depth, coming from my uh, enormous uh, fascination with, from, with, with the British Academia from my master's degree that I did here in, in the London School of Hygiene in 99. So it's for me a unique opportunity, but I feel really, uh, feel really humbled. I feel very, very humbled by Ben's presentation. I thought I was going to bring here the, the, the contact with the reality, but he has been really bringing something, something special. So I, I hope you will, you will get from me something uh, up to, up to what you would expect from, from MSF. Um, I want to thank Medact and all of you first for, for what you have done and then for what we are going to be doing later, for all the support and solidarity with, with our colleagues and with the population of Kunduz and with many other millions of people in the world who, who, who will suffer enormously the consequences of the attack on the 3rd of October on, on MSF hospital in Kunduz in the north of Afghanistan. My, my real wholehearted appreciation from this on behalf of of the MSF teams in, in Afghanistan and those who, who suffered the attack. The, the, the panel I've been invited to talk is about uh, responding to war and militarization as a health community. I think, I think medical humanitarian action takes a brutal shortcut on this. We respond to war providing medical assistance. Just, just like this, we, we take things, uh, we take things to the point to what comes more, more instinctively. Because um, humanitarian action, as it is understand, understood by MSF and by other uh, forms of humanitarian action rooted in the civil society and not the, the official uh, government-led or institutional-led humanitarian action, it's, it's a very instinctive primary reaction. It's, 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 it's something really in between an emotional and a rational action. It's the, it's the instinctive impulse to assist other human beings out of the outrage and empathy we feel for the suffering. It's, a, it's not very sophisticated. It's something really, uh, as I said, basic and instinctive. The aim is instinctively to assist them. It's, it's, fellow human beings in, in critical atrocious situations who deserve to survive them. And we, we aim, first of all, to assist them surviving them, wars, earthquakes, epidemics. Secondly, to decrease their suffering. Probably these two could be argued seriously, but, but we, we are more and more committed to, we were not 20, 30 years ago, and we said it was a mortality fighting organization. I think today we have evolved a lot on being much more human and, and being much more concerned, not only about, about broader suffering, including emotional and mental health, but also about dignity. I think, I think restoring uh, people's dignity is, is, is crucial, and it comes exactly from the basic human impulse to assist them. They are not numbers, they are not the statistics, they are not biological packages either, they are human beings like us, and then they should be treated and supported to recover the dignity. The most, probably the best example of this is the, thanks God, big shift of MSF nearly 15 years ago in taking seriously sexual violence. Sexual violence, I have to confess with shame that in the, in the early 90s 
was considered a non-related to mortality event, and the NSF was not fully committed to deal with it. There was intense discussions uh, in which the argument of the dignity of the people we assist came very heavily, and we have embraced since 2003-5 very, very thoroughly uh, the, the assistance to victims of sexual violence. But we are really committed to to restore the dignity of, of of persons. Humanitarian action. It's it's really about here and now. It's as I said, it's not conceptual. It's it's tactile. It's about people we can touch, smell, and hear crying. It's it's a, it's it's very pragmatic, very action oriented, and hence, despite all the all its aura and all the complexity of, of implementing it, is very very humble. I wish Medicines and Frontiers could have the solution to the war in Somalia. It would have ended in 91, I can promise you. I wish we could uh, be able to convince, right now, the US Army and other regular armies from states to stop bombing hospitals. They would stop today if we could. We humbly struggle to provide medical healthcare assistance to people trapped in extremely difficult situations. We thoroughly respect and are concerned about the future. We think the, what we have heard this morning in the presentation about the, 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 the global health uh, landscape, it's, it, was, it was extremely concerning even, even from, for, for someone uh, rooted on the daily, 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 daily activity. But I think for, for us, the, the present is calling us. And it's calling us, the present I'm not talking about today, referring to 2015 as a whole, the present is extremely worrying. For an organization like, like uh, MSF, we are beginning to feel very, very, very overwhelmed by the reality today. Against a, a background of an increasing trend of, of malfunctioning and uh, I would, say, I would say nearly neglect and lack of political will of the, of the official humanitarian system to reach victims of wars, particularly wars who are not of interest, and again against a, a backdrop also of a, of a progressive uh, disregard, as we have heard many times today, of the of the plight of civilians trapped in conflicts. This is a trend that we have been growing in the last uh, years and months. I'm going to refer to you about the last four months only. See about the immediacy. We, in, in the last four months, there has been a serious twist for worsening of the life of many, many uh, individuals, families, and, and collectivities. The, the atrocious civil war in Syria keeps worsening. In the last four months, we have seen the entering of a new state as a, as a war play, Russia, that has increased the, the violence and the number of attacks. We have seen the, the what seems to be end with this, the definitive siege of, of Aleppo and, and a unprecedented for MSF who has been a first hand witness of the war in Syria, increase of attacks on civilians in general and on hospitals in particular. Syria has seriously deteriorated its situation in the last four months since July. We have now a new wave of tens of thousands of displaced people inside the, inside the country. I wouldn't relate it directly to the refugee crisis in Europe, but, but there is something in there. Um, still serious on the news from time to time. I don't know when is the last time you heard about Central African Republic or about South Sudan in the media. These two countries who had both of them a situation of, of chronic conflict and instability for decades, who both of them entered in an atrocious civil war last year, who had a peak last year, well, it is, both countries are experiencing a new peak of brutal violence. Our teams are on the edge of evacuating from Bangui and from the north of the country in Central African Republic, where violence against civilians is again on the increase. And the reports coming from South Sudan are, a, are really, really uh, chilling. The situation is worse than we have ever seen in South Sudan. We saw last year patients being executed in the beds of our hospitals. We saw our hospitals raised down. We had quite a number of our staff disappear or killed. This year, the last three months, is much worse. We have the situation in Yemen. Yemen was another country with a chronic uh, instability, a, a serious amount of, of uh, violence going on for the last decades. 
since April, it has entered a new phase of, of war, probably you will know, between the, the Houthi rebels and the coalition led by Saudi Arabia, where uh, total modern warfare is happening daily upon the population of Yemen for the last month, with their deterioration in the last three months. The, the, the coalition is using airstrikes, sophisticated but relentless and not so well targeted as we suffered recently. The Houthis are using a much more old-fashioned, simple artillery, simply bluntly against civilian uh, enclaves where they may be allies. It's, it's an all-out war that is completely ignored for the media for, for very, very, uh, we think that for very really clear political reasons. I think the, the, the coalition includes uh, many other powerful Western countries like the UK and the US, the coalition that, that supports Australia. In Europe, the, the situation of the refugees and the migrants coming to Europe through Greece or the, or the ones crossing the Mediterranean, it's something you may feel familiar for the last year. So it has changed dramatically this year, dramatically to the point that already in May, MSF took the unprecedented step of, 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 of putting in place three boats to start being rescue because we, we thought that the, the, the European Union have dropped down completely the responsibilities and changed that into a securitization paramilitary operation of hunting down uh, human traffickers. And there was a need for preventing people to die drowning. Um, and on the land, on the circuit through, through Greece into Turkey, in the first uh, six months of the year, there was 150,000 people maximum that, that came that way. You have seen the news. It, this is happening since July till now also. The, 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 the massive displacement of people, mostly from Syria, also from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Somalia, from, it's, it's, it's bursting up. Uh, finally, last but not least, we have heard a fantastic presentation from media about uh, Israel and Palestine this morning. Uh, you will note that the situation in Israel and Palestine is deteriorating enormously in the last weeks and months. It's all coming during the last weeks and months with a sharp, sharp increase in violence uh, coming to a level of intercommunal violence and, and mm. civilian to uh, civilian violence, which is of, 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 a, of a new level, I will tell you later. And all this happens on the background where um, Kibbutz, <coughs> east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, Darfur, uh, and many other conventional or unconventional wars keep being at the same level of violence and human suffering as they have been for the last decades. And not to forget something we tend to disregard when we look officially at, uh, at warfare and conflicts. Uh, probably the situation of millions of people in Mexico, El Salvador, and Honduras is, is, uh, is very, very, uh, in Guatemala, is very equivalent to living in a situation of war. It's only that in their case, is violent triggered by, by uh, criminal gangs and state corruption that keeps them trapped. This is another big, big uh, blind spot that is, that is where MSF is putting enormous efforts to try to learn how to, how to. The situation is such that it's not only the obsessive, skewed look of MSF at the world looking like the firemen looks for the fires only. We look only at crisis and it looks like we are still worried. Well, that is not the case. I think the, the statement the 1st of November of, of uh, Ban Ki-moon and Peter Maurer, the, the, the head of UN and the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross together, uh, talking them about the brutal increase on victims of conflicts and the, the disturbing paralysis of the world to react to it, it, it kind of reaffirms that this is not our skewed and, and biased view on the problem. Particularly is of extreme concern the attacks on healthcare. And I want to remark attacks on healthcare because too often inside MSF and here around, we tend to go to remark the issue of attacks on humanitarians. Dear friends, attacking Congolese Ministry of Health staff is atrocious and should not be allowed. Attacking Palestinian hospitals that do not have an international presence should not be allowed. It's not us humanitarians. It's the problem of the non-respect for healthcare, for healthcare structures, healthcare professionals and patients. It's, it's happened along the history of warfare always. It's happened always. Um, and it's atrocious because the, the, the consequences of, of war on individuals and populations are, are many. I think we, we have discussed a little bit. The direct consequences, war wounds, etc. You have the, 
the, the immediate and direct, the lack of the lack of food, lack of shelter, lack of clean water. But it goes really, it goes really much, much further. Any population experiencing war or conflict has an increased need for health care. So targeting and damaging healthcare assistance and healthcare processes and the healthcare staff is really hurting when the need is higher for, for people trapped in conflict. It's adding one more hit, one more, one more. Um, traditionally, in many, we have, in the last two centuries, and mostly driven by the Western world, we have the Geneva Conventions and International Humanitarian Law, who stipulate very clearly about it. But let's not forget that this is something we see in other cultures and other traditions. I remember now, top of my mind, just quickly, Saladin, the, the famous Saladin oh, that was uh, fighting against Richard Lionheart in the Crusades. He had a very, very, very explicit letter with instructions to his troops about respecting civilians, respecting the crops, and not poisoning the wells. It's not, it, it exists in many of the traditions. I think, I don't want to get into the, Ben is not sitting here, but uh, there has been at times in history, and it is there behind, some sort of a code of honor about how to conduct warfare in many different cultures. You can go into, into tribal, tribal warfare in Papua New Guinea, etc. There is, there is ways of regulating war. Our way, what we have constructed at the world after the Second World War, was the Geneva Conventions that aim basically at humanized wars. They are, again, extremely humble. I know many uh, peace activists that despise this humanitarian humbleness. They say, why are not you much more ambitious? International humanitarian law accepts wars and tries to create narrow spaces of humanity within the wars. The, the, the main ambition of, of international humanitarian law is to protect and assist non-combatants in situation of war is to spare prisoners of wars, civilians, shipwrecked uh, from, from, from the war. They are not, not taking <coughs> part in the hostilities. Um, all this, and this, this has been signed <coughs> by, by most of the states of the world today, and they carry on a legal obligation and carry on a, 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 moral, a, moral, uh, a moral weight and a moral uh, framework that, 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 that should be encouraged and respected. It's extremely relevant for, for to MSF for two reasons. First of all, um, the way the current humanitarian uh, thinking and action started was with uh, Monsieur Henri Dunant on a battlefield in Solferino, watching the wounded of the two sides suffering enormously and deciding that it was vital that in battles healthcare should be spared from being attacked. So at least once soldiers are, are wounded, they can be cared for and to protect healthcare in battle. So the protection of the, of the, of the healthcare assistance is completely intrinsic and at the roots of, of the international humanitarian law and at the humanitarian instinct and the humanitarian mm -hmm. action. And then for much more practical and simple reasons, it is exactly the non-protection of healthcare that drives us, international, external, neutral organizations, to have to go to places where conflict is happening to replace the facility that has been targeted, damaged, or threatened. There is, there is a clear relationship between the attacks on health facilities and the need for external actors to, to go and, and, and interfere. Just a quick quick run, I think it's a pity. If I say it, would be here, they would be able to do it much, much better. But there is very clear specifications in terms of humanitarian law for the protection of, of, of health facilities and medical facilities. To be protected, they have to be identified. I think the army should know what to shoot at and not to, and they have to be clearly identified. That's very obvious, and it's not the case in any of the recent attacks at all. And secondly, they have to remain neutral. They, they need not to be used by one of the parties to take advantage in the, conf in the conflict. That's, that's, extremely, that's extremely important. Uh, in, the, in the MSF experience, uh, we are uh, engaging with the ICRC initiative to raise attention on the issue and try to change the trends. Uh, we have been researching. There is very broadly four, four main groups or, or sorts of attacks on, on health facilities. First, we have the ones for profit. People go into health facilities, yes, for theft of to take to make use of resources. We have been having, having this uh, repeatedly in Central African Republic in the last year. We have been uh, attacked many times just for 
robbery purposes, carjacking, etc. Secondly, uh, we have attacks on health facilities because they are harboring specific groups that, that are targeted. Uh, the, the worst example, the Rwandan genocide, where all Tutsi patients in all of MSF hospitals were killed in their beds systematically, or much more recently in, in, in southern Sudan. Third, we have the blanket or carpet disregard for civilian that includes hospitals. That's, that's what uh, we are seeing in Yemen today. It's just, it's just disregard for schools, mosques, hospitals, markets, and civilian um, accommodation. And fourth and last, and is the one that is more of concern, it's selective, is when it is only and selectively the hospital that is targeted or only the doctors and nurses that are killed. That is, that is a fourth type that we're coming across and that we have an enormous increase of the last fourth time in the last, in the last, in the last decade, I would say. I think the, the, the issue really jumped up on the wake of the Arab Springs. First, we had Bahrain. Bahrain has a single huge main public health hospital that uh, where the, the security forces started coming in and out regularly to identify the wounded as uh, opposition and then arresting them. Then they started being extremely harsh on, on, on the health staff. But there is a caveat here, important one. In the beginning of the Arab Springs, that hospital itself massively took a very public position against the government. So they signified themselves completely, which is extremely respectable from the, from the point of view of political mobilization. It really legally, from an from a international humanitarian law, made them lose their protection, not militarily, but certainly politically. And in practical terms, it was attracting uh, violence on them. In the case of Syria, it's, it's different. In the case of Syria, from the very beginning, um, 2011, 2012, when we had some staff of MSF managing to go uh, undercover with the, with the opposition uh, medical units, uh, we were told, as opposed everywhere where, where we go, normally to, to countries at war, we bring the stethoscope and we're ready to show it in any checkpoint. And he's saying, no, no, I'm a doctor. I came here to take care of the children. I'm a doctor. And normally, the, the armed groups wave you through, and it's a good way. We were told by, by our medical colleagues in Syria from the beginning, if you are stopped by military security forces, say you are a journalist. If you're a doctor, you will be arrested or worse. So the targeting of, of, of healthcare activities in Syria has been there from the beginning. It has moved from political repression to very selective, repeated targeting of, of hospitals. We think it's extremely worrying, and as I said, in the, in the last month, we have had the, the, the attack on Kunduz. I think we are going to have a moment of remembrance later, and I think I will be able to explain to you more in detail. In Syria, during the month of October, 12 hospitals in an area that is supported by MSF have been thoroughly targeted and destroyed and rendered useless. Um, on the 26th of October, the, the surgical accuracy of the uh, Saudi Air Forces missed or did right and destroyed the Highland Hospital that was being supported by MSF uh, within a uh, destruction of the whole Highland village. Targeted the school, the hospital, the mosque is, is one of these more carpet destruction. And finally, I want to, to remark that would, within the context of what we are seeing in, in uh, in Palestine today, only two days ago, a unit of special forces of the Israeli army entered the Al-Ahli hospital in Hebron to arrest a patient who was freshly wounded, lying in a bed, shot very immediately without any, there was many questions about whether it was an, uh, shot the person who was by his side, a relative, and arrested the person in a, in a brutal operation. This is. This is one more uh, brutal challenge to the protection, to the protected space of, of healthcare facilities. People who are wounded are not immune from law to respond for whatever they have to respond, but they don't, they need to be allowed to receive medical treatment. They can be arrested when they are discharged. This, this is absolutely, absolutely unnecessary. And the statements of the Israeli, Israeli security forces saying, we will, there is no sacred space anymore. We will chase you wherever you are. This is a very, very explicit challenge to the neutrality of, of, uh, of health facilities. We are very, I'm wrapping up quickly. We are, we are very, very worried about this uh, brutal erosion of, of, the, of, the, of the international humanitarian law 
in particular about the importance of the of the protection and respect for for healthcare we think that uh, there is a high risk of 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 copycatting and 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 pushing the pushing the threshold and of us the general public of tolerance and normalization it is normal that in wars hospitals are bombed it is not normal and should not be so that's that's what we i think we have to join ranks firmly and say enough is enough i think millions of human beings in war zones need desperately to have access to health facilities for them to function they should not be targeted and destroyed um, Thank you.